would get out your Bibles and open up to two passages, I'd like you to get uh, Romans chapter 8 in one hand and 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the other. Romans chapter 8 in one hand and 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the other. Uh, I was talking to the people, uh, Brother Nash has been counting and we've, we've been up to about 50 people today. Um, so that's that's pretty good turnout. Glad to see that. Glad that you guys have uh, chosen to come out and study with us. Um, I'll say a little bit more about it uh, when I'm done and we dismiss and take a break for a while this afternoon. But uh, I do encourage all of you to come back this evening. The, the, the musicians and the band have been working hard for weeks uh, to prepare for the conference. And also we're going to have the ice cream uh, fellowship when they're done. And uh, it should just be a good time to relax and and, and talk and maybe discuss some things. I heard a lot of conversations going on at lunch about prayer and some of the things that have been discussed. So that's that's obviously the goal here. Uh, if you would, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and Romans chapter 8. I'm just going to read Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and then we'll, uh, we'll just we'll open with a word of prayer. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for the weekend and for the studies that we've had thus far. And as we think think uh, forward to this study and the two we're going to have tomorrow, that we just would continue to uh, receive these things with, with openness of mind and readiness of heart, and that these would be things that we'd be able to take into our inner man and not just know them intellectually, not just understand them as far as our ability to do so, but take them and make them a living reality in our lives as we think about prayer and, and some of these subjects. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So in the last hour, last study before we took a break for lunch, uh, Brother Tom was discussing Romans 8.26, and he was talking about the, there's some things that we don't know, but we ought to know, and then there's some things that we do know in verse 28, and we know all, we know that all things work together for good. And so what I want to kind of do in this hour is talk to you about how you can get some insights into these things that you ought to know but don't know, possibly. Okay? So I, I, I appreciated that and how that kind of set itself up nice to, for what, what I want to talk to you about in this particular hour. And the title of this study is um, Learning to Pray. No, that was the last one. This is um, <laughs> How Did Paul Pray? Learning to Pray by Following Paul's Example. And Tom also last night talked about, again, how John the Baptist taught his followers to pray, how the apostles come to Christ and ask him, how should we pray? And I said it in my first study earlier this morning that, you know, Paul is our apostle and we should look to him to instruct us regarding uh, our prayer life and, and the sorts of things that we should pray for. If you would turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, to get started, I want to present to you a concept, which isn't a new one, but I want you to think about it maybe, it maybe differently than you have. Brother David Amron, can you please go get those handouts? I completely forgot about them. We should have just about enough for everybody. Okay? All right. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, Paul writes here and he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We understand the doctrine of inspiration. Okay, we understand that God, the Holy Spirit, through, uh, through a process, led and certain, gave, uh, communicated God's Word to men who then took those words and wrote them down uh, through a process of inspiration. So we understand what that means. Okay? What's interesting to consider, though, is I, I know I'm not telling you anything new if I were to tell you that Paul's, Paul's epistles were inspired. I mean, obviously, if, if they're in the Bible and, and, and Paul wrote them and so on, they're, they're inspired scripture and they're in the Bible. But one of the things that maybe is often quite not so obvious is the concept that included within Paul's epistles are Holy Spirit inspired prayers. Okay? Holy Spirit inspired prayers that Paul prays for the saints. Okay? And I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but a few years back, about 2009, I was at my dad's house, no, it was actually 2008, I was at my dad's house for Thanksgiving and was looking around at his books, and there was this book off in the corner, a little small book, called, can I have one please? Discovering the Power of the Prayers of Paul. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting, so I grabbed it and I started looking at it, 
And what, what, what the premise of the book was, and this is not written by a, you know, a, a dispensationally minded individual, but the premise of the book was to look at the different <coughs> prayers of the Apostle Paul as a means of instructing us about how to pray. And I'm like, wow, this is interesting. How come I never thought of this? So I finished up that series, and in 2009 I bought a copy of that book, and I read it, and I looked at it, and let me just say right now, you don't want to buy the book if you want the guy's doctrine. The guy's doctrine is not good, but the, the concept was interesting, and that's what kind of led me or turned me onto it. And so I preached a whole series of sermons here in 2009 to, to this assembly called Praying the Powerful Prayers of Paul. And the premise of it was to study the things that Paul says in his epistles as a means of instructing us as members of the body of Christ about how we should be, the sorts of things that, that were on Paul's heart, on Paul's mind, and things that we should be praying for as members of the church and the body of Christ. And so throughout Paul's epistles we find these Holy Spirit inspired prayers that Paul prays on behalf of the churches. And it's interesting, when, when Tom's talking about this idea that, you know, our infirmities there, and, and we don't know what to pray for, but we ought to know what to pray for, what, some paying attention to what Paul prayed and how he prayed, I think can instruct us to help deal with that issue of informing us about how we maybe ought to pray, okay? And so the premise that I want to I wanna go off of this morning, or sorry, this afternoon, is to look at some of these prayers. We're not going to look at all of them. If you would, you should have received just now the index, an index of Pauline prayer. And as it says at the top, the indices are taken and adapted, significantly adapted, okay? Um, I changed a lot of the wording in some of these because it was, it was non-KJV wording and it was confusing and I didn't like it. But if you look at the sheet that you were given, the first indice is a just a list of all the prayers of Paul found in the New Testament, starting with the book of Romans and running all the way through Philemon. If you look at page two, you'll see that they're broken out there by different categories or different types. And so the, the chart indicates power prayers. What I'm, those are the big ones, the big prayers, the, the, the major prayers of the Apostle Paul. And then there are the more minor prayers listed out. And then on the page three, you have um, prayers of praise and thanksgiving and then benedictions. So if you just took this chart, it's to serve as an index to go through Paul's epistles and find where, where Paul's epistles he prays. And, and just a brief statement about maybe what's, what's contained within that prayer. So what I want to do this in this uh, time is look at a few of these power prayers. I'm not going to have time to teach you. This series went on for like 12 weeks. Okay, we're not going to have time to totally dissect every one of these, but I just want you to. I want you to look at them and just be thinking about what is Paul praying for in each one of these prayers on behalf of the saints. So the first one I want you to go to, if you would, go to Romans chapter 15. Go to Romans chapter 15. And look at verse 5. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. And what I've tried to do on the PowerPoint is sort of break down these prayers in terms of their component parts and what is it that Paul is actually praying on, on behalf of the different saints and assemblies here. Look at Romans chapter 15, verse 5. It says, Now the God of peace and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Okay? Verse, um, verse 6. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so basically if you, if you look at that, what Paul is doing there is he's He's saying that there are some things that Paul, there are some things that Paul wants God the Father to grant or give unto the Romans. And in, you see the first one in verse 5, that they would be, uh, that he would grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. And then in verse 6, he says that, that ye may be, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is Paul's wish? What is Paul's desire? What is he praying on behalf of the Romans? He's praying on behalf of the Romans that they would function in this way, that they would function with this like-mindedness, that they would, that they would be, be able to function in such a like mind that they would, in verse 6, 
that they would be of, of one mind and of one speech, and thereby they would glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's just a few words about this. The Roman assembly is a diverse assembly, okay? There are all sorts of people. Rome is the capital of the ancient world at the time, the capital of the Roman Empire. There are all kinds of people passing to and fro in and out of Rome that are, that are coming into contact with believers in, in Rome and so on. And so there's, there's some issues within Rome. Go back to chapter 14. Just to point out a few of them. Chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. Let him that eateth despise not him that eateth not, and let him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath, for God hath received him. And so you, you see that within the church at Rome, there's all these different opinions. There's different opinions about meats. There's different opinions about uh, days and esteeming one day greater than another. Look at verse 5. One man esteemeth one day, uh, one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Every man may, uh, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And so you can see right off the bat there, if you, if you just go back a little bit into chapter 14, that, that there's a lot of diversity of opinion about some of this stuff within the Roman church. And, and there, there, there's, a dis there's disagreement about meats. There's disagreement about days and, and, and so on. Look at verse 14. He, he begins to address this and he says, I know that I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean uh, of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now, uh, now walkest thou not uh, charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for, for whom Christ died. Look at verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and, and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Uh, verse, verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for what? For peace. Okay? And the things wherewith we may edify another. So this is the situation. Paul's writing to an assembly that has people in it that are of this diversity of, of religious opinion about what's acceptable, what is not acceptable. And you come to chapter five, chapter 15, look at verse 1. He says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities. Interesting that he uses that word given what we studied in the last hour. Be, bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please who? Ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to what? Edification. Well, how is that going to happen? Okay, and that leads you then down into verse 5, where he says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the passage, Paul is making a strong, a strong argument for the Romans to de-emphasize, if you will, their minor issues, their disagreements over meats and days and, and, and all this sort of thing, and favor, in back in chapter 14, verse 19, that which edifies. And the only way they're going to do that is if they are going to is, is if they're going to learn to function with a like-mindedness. Okay? And so the prayer that he that he utters on their behalf. Or that he asked God to grant them in verses in chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, is, is that they would learn that they would have this like-mindedness, and out of that like-mindedness that he prays for in verse 5, that they would have that they would have one mind and one mouth, and thereby be able to glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what, what, I, what I'm getting at here is if you want to know what to pray, if you want to know what to pray for this assembly, that's what you should pray for this assembly. You should pray that the saints of Grace Life Bible Church or wherever assembly you're from would function with a what? With a like-mindedness. With a like-mindedness about the Scripture uh, based on understanding that's coming from God's Word. And when Paul looks at the Romans, he says what the Romans need is they need to function in a like-minded manner. And so he prays for that on their behalf that out of this like-mindedness in, in verse 5, then in verse 6, they'd be able to, with one mind and one mouth, glorify God. And so, just to sort of 
cap encapsulate this before we move on to the next one that I just want to touch on. The key to being, a lot of, this issue being like-minded. The key to being like-minded is not agreeing more and arguing less. You, you, can, you can see why that would be the case. Well, to be like-minded, we just have to stop arguing so much. And we need to agree with each other more. Rather, like-mindedness rests in letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, thereby allowing the saints at Rome, and by extension us, to think and operate with the mind of Christ. Where do we get the mind of Christ? From the Scripture. So, if we're going to have this like-mindedness, again, it comes back to us knowing some things out of where? Out of the Scripture. Okay? Let's go to another one. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So again, what we're doing here is we're just looking at some of these prayers, looking at the kinds of things that Paul prayed on behalf of the saints and the assemblies. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my walk. Prayers. Now, we, we talked about that concept of ceasing not to give thanks and making mention. We, we went over that already uh, in the first time I taught earlier today. Okay? So what is Paul doing? What is he praying for the Ephesians with respect to? And he's going to tell you some specific things. So he says in verse 15, Wherefore also I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints. So does Paul hear reports about what's going on in Ephesus? According to verse 15. Verse 16, on account of what he hears in verse 15, he ceases not to give thanks for, for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Okay, what is he praying for them? Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What's the first thing that... What Paul's praying is that God would give unto the Ephesians the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now look at, read on, verse 17, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. Now watch verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being what? So do you get the idea? What is Paul praying for the Ephesians? Is he praying for the Ephesians that they'll have financial security and stability and they'll be in good health and there won't be any sickness and there won't be any, any sorts of you know, uh, physical problems or ailments or whatever amongst the saints that are in Ephesus? No, he's praying for them, number one, to have the eyes of their understanding what? Enlightened. Okay? Are there some things that he wants them to understand? And the things he wants them to understand, he's going to pray for them with respect to those things. Verse, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. What's the next word, verse 18? That. So the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, is it going to lead to something? That, you guys are, see I told you, too much pizza for some of you. <laughs> that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Now, I want, I'll just, you need to see. He wants them to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him so that some certain things could be true among the saints at Ephesus. Number one in verse 18, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. That ye may know what is the hope of His calling. So does He want them to have their understanding enlightened so that they know what the hope of His calling is for them? What the hope of their calling is? Okay, and then he goes on and he says, um, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So this is all stuff that Paul is praying on behalf of the Ephesians. Now we could spend an entire weekend conference just dissecting these verses and explaining all the doctrine in here that there is to explain. And that's not my point right now. My point right now is not to expound line by line, word by word, verse by verse through this passage. It's just to get you to think about what is, Paul's, what is Paul praying on behalf of the saints. And then he says, so in, there's, there's three things in verse 18. 
Number one, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, so that they might know the hope of their calling, and so that they and, and, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Notice that that is not your inheritance. That's whose inheritance? His inheritance. And his inheritance is found in who? Us. In the saints. Okay? So there's some things here that Paul wants them to know. There's some things that he's praying that they will be able to understand. Verse 19. And what is the exceed and in addition, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Now I'm gonna tell you right now, I can't tell you how many times I've read that, even studying things in that those verses, and it never dawned on me, and I'm just made it might just be a blockhead or something. But it never dawned on me that this is what Paul is praying for the Ephesians. So if you look at what is Paul desire, what is what is his desire for the saints? What is well, let's go beyond that. What is what is the Godhead's desire for the uh, saints at Ephesus? It's that they would have the eyes of their understanding enlightened, and by and thereby they would be able to know what's the hope of their calling. That they would know what the riches of his inheritance, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And that they would be able to comprehend what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who, who believe. See, the exceeding greatness of his power has already been manifest toward you. Okay? The same power that, that was exercised when Jesus Christ rose from the dead has already been extended onto you as a believer on your behalf. Don't you think you better know that? And wouldn't it benefit you as a believer to know that? So would that, would that maybe help you when a situation arose and you're scratching your head saying, you know, I just don't really know what I'm supposed to pray. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Hopefully you do. Let's look at another one. Come with me to chapter 3. <coughs> chapter 3. And again, we could say a lot about each one of these. But that's not really my purpose right now. Look at verse 14. He says, well, verse 13, he says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not in my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Why would he say that? Why would he say in verse 13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not in my tribulations for who? For you. Why would he well, go, back to, go back to verse 1. For this cause I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Why is Paul in prison? He's in prison because of his carrying forth of his Gentile apostleship. Okay? And he says, and he knows that this has the capacity at least to rattle the Ephesians. To see Paul in prison for doing what he's supposed to do, for preaching the message that they're believing, then he says in verse in verse 13, he says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory, verse 14, for this cause. So it's, it, it's for the cause and his desire that the Ephesians faint not when they hear about what's happening to the Apostle Paul. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So what is he doing in verse 14 and 15? Is he praying? Verse 16, that he would grant you according to, according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit. Where? Where? In your inner man. Okay? So according to God the Father's riches and glory, Paul prays, that the Ephesians would, number one, be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Does He pray for a hedge of protection around the Ephesians so that they don't end up in prison as well? No. Does He pray for the divine, supernatural, providential uh, you know, intervention of God that if somebody comes and tries to give the Ephesians trouble that they, that, that they won't be able to? Is that what he's praying on their behalf? No, he's praying that they would be strengthened with might by his spirit where? In their inner man. Now watch how this, watch how he builds on all of this information. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that, first in the intent, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How? By faith. 
He wants Christ to dwell in the hearts of the saints at Ephesus. That, now look, the word dwell, I'm just going to say this quickly. You could come dwell at my house as your fixed place of residence. But does that mean you've made yourself at home? No. No. Look, we got a rule in our house, you take your shoes off. Maybe you don't have that rule in your house. But if you're gonna if, if you're gonna make yourself at home, are you gonna behave the way you would as though you were in your own house? Are you the temple of God? Have you and I, do we always allow the Lord Jesus Christ to rearrange the furniture in your life? Do we allow him to go to the fridge and drink out of a milk carton? Okay, you understand? You come to my house, you would never do that. You would never go to my fridge and make it. Okay. But when he says dwell, he doesn't mean that maybe Christ is dwelling in you, maybe he's not. He means that you would, just think about what he's arguing here, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit, where? In the inner man, to the degree, so that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. He's talking about you allowing Christ to so dwell in you that he makes, his, he makes his home where? Within you. He doesn't mean that maybe you have him, maybe you don't. Maybe he's there, maybe he isn't. He means, he means taking this understanding in your inner man that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Now watch. That, he goes further, that ye may rooted and grounded in what? In love, may be, now watch verse 18, may be able to comprehend. Isn't it interesting when you think about the last study that we had, when he says, for you know not what you should pray for as you what? Ought. Here, he's praying on their behalf that they might what? Comprehend. Comprehend some things. That they might understand some things. That they might have some doctrinal understandings. That they might have some spiritual capacities built into their inner man. So that when the stuff going on outside of them, verses 13 and 14, happens, they don't faint. They don't, they don't curl up and, 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 and shrivel into themselves when the tribulation comes. Because is it sure to come eventually? Just, just give it some time. People ask me, how are things going in your church? Oh, they're all going fine for now. It's only a matter of time before something what? Happens. Why? Because you're dealing with people. And anytime you deal with people, there's going to be what? Issues. Trouble. Disagreements. That's why he prays for the Romans that they would be like what? Like-minded. So he says in verse 18... May be able to comprehend, may be able to comprehend, understand with all saints. Is this just the sort of elite, exclusive club that Paul wants to know this stuff? Or does he want all the saints to comprehend this information? Okay? May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Verse 19. And to know the love of Christ which passeth which passeth in knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh where? In us. See, folks, what Paul is what he's praying for here, what what he's after, and what he's praying for, is that the, the believers in Ephesus. Would, would be so, um, in, verse, in verse 16, that they would be so strengthened with might and spirit in the inner man to the end, in verse 19, that they would be able to know the love of Christ with passive knowledge that they might be filled with all the fullness of food of God. So hold your hand there and go back to chapter 1 quick. Verse 15 again. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith and love and uh, faith, sorry, faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, there it is, know 
Remember what Tom said in, in, in Romans chapter 8? He says there's some, thing, there's some things that you ought to know, and then there's some things that you ought. That you know. I, I, I've heard, I heard Brother Jordan say this a long time ago in Grace School of Bible. He drew a, he drew a chart on the board. Okay? And I, I've, I've copied it myself, so I got it from him. See, I'm citing my sources. Okay? He says that out here you have some things that you don't know. Okay? In here you have some things that you kind of want. That you kind of know. And in here you have the stuff that you know that you want. No. Your Christian life is not designed to be functioned on the basis of ignorance. So the more things you can move from here to here, and from here to here, and know that you know them, give you a capacity in your, in your life as a believer to function in the way God would intend for you to function as a member of the body of Christ. And that's what he's praying here. He's praying that they, in verse 18, that they would know this stuff. In chapter 3, verse um, 18, he's praying that they might comprehend what is going on here. And all of this is really functioning or is centering around something that's going to take place where? Out here in the circumstances or inside them as members of the body of Christ. So that when the circumstances come, you have this reservoir of spiritual knowledge to draw from to help you know how to deal with the situations and the circumstances of life. That is the kind of thing that Paul is praying for on behalf of the Ephesians. So I have a question before we move on. When was the last time you prayed, what was the last time you prayed that for yourself or someone else? <coughs> so what I'm getting at is this. We say, well, I just don't know what to pray. Okay, we understand that. But start, wouldn't this be a good place to start? Start by seeing what Paul says to pray for. Learn from Paul about what Paul says to pray and how to pray and what to pray for and take that information into your inner man and study that information and allow that information then to, to, to saturate your, your knowledge and your, your ability to comprehend and so that out of that knowledge that you have, you can now function in your life on the basis of some understandings. Come with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 9. Philippians 1 9. He says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Go back, go back quickly to, to, to Ephesians. Is this the first time we heard about this issue of love? He's, he's, he's mentioning it. Uh, go, go back to Ephesians 3. Look at verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you've been rooted and grounded in what? In love. You come over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. He says, In this I pray that your love <coughs> may abound yet more and what? More. Okay? That your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge there's the issue of knowledge again, okay? Now watch what it says, in knowledge and in all what? Judgment. Well, what, your ability to judge is going to come out of what you know. If you don't know something, do you have the capacity to, do you have the capacity to take what you don't know and use it for anything? No, because you don't what? You don't know it. So he says, In this I pray that your love may abound in more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that, person the intent, that ye may approve the things that are what? Excellent. And that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So Paul prays the following on behalf of the Philippians. That their love may abound more and more in two specific ways. In knowledge and in what? In judgment, that they may approve things that are excellent. So the ability to, the, when their love abounds more and more in knowledge and judgment, that's going to give them the capacity to approve things that are what? 
excellent, when they, when they have the capacity to approve things that are excellent, then it says that they may be sincere and without offense till the day of what? Christ. So how long is this supposed to last? Till the day of Christ. Yeah, till, till, the, till the end of the dispensation of grace. And the end is that they would be filled with the fruits of what? Righteousness. Look at verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, even, uh, sorry, which are by Jesus Christ unto the praise, uh, unto the praise, uh, uh, sorry, unto the glory and praise of God. Now, just a few things here. This is when he says that your love here is not talking about your romantic love. He's not talking about that you would love your husband or wife more and more every day. It's not what he means. All right? He's not talking about. He's not talking about that concept, okay? This, this is the love. The love he's talking about here is the same love that motivated Christ to go die for your sin when you were yet a sinner, Romans 5, 8, okay? This is the kind of love, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, that ought to constrain us. The love of Christ constraining us, okay? It is us increasing and abounding more and more in that kind of love. That, that's, that's what he's after here. Okay, In verse 9, Paul says that the Philippians would abound, overflow, exceed, or increase more and more in this love. Okay, And look at what it says. Look, look carefully. And this is why I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Did they already have this to a degree? But his prayer is that they would continue to what? Increase in this or decrease? Increase. Increase. And as they increase, it's going to allow them to approve things that are what? Excellent. Okay? So the use of the word yet implies that the Philippians already love one another. But since love is a quantitative entity, there is always room for more of it. There's always room for improvement. Paul's prayers that the Philippians would abound, increase, or grow beyond their present capacity. Understanding of, of, of what's going on here. And the idea, look at verse 9, you may abound yet more and more. That, that language there that reminds me a lot of Romans, go, go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. <coughs> Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. That's the same love that Paul's talking about in Philippians chapter 1. And they would grow, then they would. Uh, increase or abound yet more and more in. Um, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ what? Okay, so did he love you when you were a sinner? Yes. Check your head, yes. Okay, how much did he love you? He loved you enough that he would what? Die for you. What are the first three words in verse 9? <coughs> much, more than. much more than being now what? So if, did he love you, how much did he love you when you were yet a sinner that he sent Christ to die for you? He loved you a lot, right? Now that you're justified, now that you're a believer, how much more does he love you what? You see, you see, you see how there's an increase going on there. Go back to Philippians. So his prayer in verse 9 here, chapter 1 verse 9, is that your love may abound. It may increase yet more and more in knowledge. And in, and in all judgment. Okay? And it is through this love abounding in knowledge and judgment in verse 9 that would allow the Philippians to test, examine, scrutinize, um, recognize the counterfeit for, from the genuine, if you will, the things that are what? Excellent. Okay? And the result of, of that is going to allow them to approve the things that are excellent, that they may be sincere and without offense, how long? Till when? Till the day of Christ. So again, by approving things that are excellent, not only would they keep themselves pure concerning their own faith and practice, okay, 
But, but, but what's going what's to happen also is it's going to, it's going to lead, in my opinion, to similar like-mindedness to what Paul prays for the um, Philippians, or sorry, the Romans. And as, as the love of the believers abounds in, perfect, in, in, in knowledge and judgment of the truth given for, the, for this dispensation, it's going to enable them and us to approve things that are excellent, that, that our lives can be lived in a way that is, that is free, as it says there in verse uh, um, 10, that, that's free of offense. But again, notice in verse 9 that your love may abound yet more and more in love. So again, are you expected to know something? Paul's prayers are consistently about what he desires the saints and the assemblies to what? And out of the capacity of knowledge, it will allow them to draw out of this and make what? Judgments. It will allow them to approve things. It will allow them to prove things. To test things. Uh, it, says in, it says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it talks about, uh, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Right? And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may what? Prove. Prove what? That good, acceptable, and perfect what? Will of God. And it's going to come out of an ability to what? To prove. Well, look, if I don't, if I don't know it, is that going to put me at a disadvantage? Come with me, let's look at one more. Come to Colossians chapter 1. I hope this is making sense to you. I wish we had time to expound on, on every, every detail of these. But come to Colossians chapter 1. Start at verse 9. He says, For this cause, since the day we heard it, cease not to pray for you, and to desire, now watch, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his what? Yeah. What, what? What concept keeps coming up? Yeah. Knowledge, will, being filled with these things. The word filled here has the idea of being sort of, I'm going to put it sort of generically, but full to capacity to the point where you can't get anything more into a space. Desire that you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual what? Understanding. So the prayer is, Paul acknowledges since the day he heard of their love of the Spirit, he did not cease to pray for the Colossians that they might be, number one, filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What's the first word in verse 10? Yeah. That. So what's the, what's the purpose of the intent of being filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding? It's that, number in verse 10, that you might walk worthy of, of the Lord uh, unto all what? Pleasing. Pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, these, this is Paul's heart in prayer for the Colossians. He, again, he's, he's praying all this stuff that's being prayed for here. Let's continue on, and I'll make that point. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of in life. All of that is that primarily outer, exterior, circumstantial things, or is that all primarily and mostly all inner man things? Okay? So, the, the, the passages here, the prayers that Paul is, is, is praying on behalf of the saints, is, particularly in this one here, is that they, that they might be filled to capacity with a complete knowledge of God's will for them. Now, this, what this means is that your prayer life can't function on the basis of ignorance. Okay? You, you, if prayer, as we've said, is communing between you and God over God's Word, 
you, you cannot, that, that communion that uh, Charlie, I believe, was talking about earlier, if you, if you take God's Word out of it, do you have any communion? The greater understanding that you have of the knowledge of His will that allows you to walk worthy of the Lord on all pleasing, to be fruitful in every good work, to be increasing in the knowledge of God, and to be strengthened with all might and so forth, that is going to come out of you and I, as members of the body of Christ, understanding some things. Amen. Okay? And what I'm suggesting to you in this hour, and I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of it, because I can see some of you are drifting, is that if we would pay attention to what Paul prayed for the saints and for the assemblies, and we would study these things and we would understand what he's saying here and take those things and, 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 and use them as a way to instruct our own understanding of prayer, I think we're going to do much better, we'll be much better off in our understanding of how this works if we allow Paul to teach us how to do it. And the way he's going to teach us how to do it is if, if we study the way Paul did it and the things that Paul prayed for. Yes. Okay? Now, I have a few concluding observations, and then I want to, I have something on the board I want to share with you to sort of close out this, uh, the, the teaching aspects of today. The vast majority of Paul's prayers on behalf of the churches are spiritual in nature and concern the inner man. Okay. Rather, so I want to read this to you. Rather than praying for advantageous circumstances, reversal of unfortunate circumstances, divine physical interventions, or material possessions, Paul primarily prayed that the saints would be able to construct within their inner man both the doctrinal understandings and spiritual capacities necessary to deal with the details of life with a like-mindedness and love that would allow the work of the ministry to continue. What is Paul's primary objective? Paul's primary objective is to discharge the, 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 uh, the dispensation of the gospel that was committed to him. And he need, if that's going to happen, the saints and the assemblies and the saints that comprise those assemblies are going to have to be able to know some things and function in certain ways or there will be no work of the ministry. And Paul's primary prayer for the believers in all of, the, uh, in all of these prayers is, is for them to build, be able to build within their inner man the doctrinal understandings and the spiritual capacities that will allow them to function regardless of the situation and circumstance that they find themselves in. I did not say, and I want to point this out, I did not say that you should never pray for anything physical. Did I say that? I did not say that. Okay? Paul says, and Charlie's been talking about it tomorrow morning, he says, in everything with prayer and supplication. Would that include frustration over the car breaking down? Would that include frustration because my kids aren't listening to me? Would that include frustration because I have a financial, I have a financial struggle that I'm trying to meet and I need, and would that, would that fall in the category of with, by, with everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. If it is on your mind, if it is causing you care, you should what? Pray about it. Okay? Take it before the throne of grace. But the main reason in doing that is not to get God to hocus pocusly manipulate everything, but for you to have clarity in your thoughts, in your mind, in your understanding of how God would have you to deal with that situation or circumstance. Okay? Now, I, some people, they hear myself and others say things like this, and either it's because we're not clear or whatever, they're not listening, they say, well, what you're saying is God doesn't care about me. Are we saying that? No. No, we're not saying that. We're saying that prayer is a dispensational thing. And I want you to think about it as you leave in these terms.
Okay, so let's get the monkey out of the room. This is just this is just free of charge, worth the price of admission. If you want to remember how to how to memorize all the tribes of Israel, just remember S J Bedmazan Large. Okay. <laughs> Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulon, Asher, uh, Naphtali, Levi, Reuben, and Gad. There you go. All the tribes of Israel, okay? What, what, what I want to show you is when Israel comes out of Egypt and God instructs them to build the tabernacle, okay? Israel, the nations, the tribes of Israel encamp in their encampment around the tabernacle, okay? And the tabernacle had the outer curtain, and then it had some, some other stuff and features. I'm not so concerned about that right now. But right in there, behind the curtain there, was called the Holy of Holies. Okay? And what dwelt between the cherubim on the top of the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies? Go to, go to Exodus 25. Charlie went there. Go to Exodus 25. What dwelt in there? What? The glory of God, God Himself. Okay? Exodus 25, verse 21. <clears throat> and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Verse 22. And there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the what? Mercy. The mercy seat. From between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the testimony. Okay? So, where did the glory of God dwell in Israel? It dwelt on the top of the mercy seat, between the cherubim, in the Holy of Holies, and God says to Israel, I'm going to commune with you where? There. And so the entire camp of Israel pitches camp in this fashion all around the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is at their center. And in the, and in the Holy of Holies, in that tabernacle, is the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top of it is the mercy seat. And between the cherubim, God's presence and glory dwelt there, right? And if Israel is going to commune with God, where are they going to commune with the man? Is God physically close to Israel? He's right there. Where are they? They're pitched all around them, and God is where? Physically, were they close to Israel? Yes. Spiritually, were they? Only one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest goes in to the presence of God. Right? If he goes in there and he messes up, or he does it wrong, what happens to him? Yes. Right? He didn't have to tie, any, tie a, a rope around his ankle in case he screws up so he can pull him out so nobody else dies. Okay? So, here's Israel. They've got God in their midst. Later on, they go to the temple and God's glory dwells there. Eventually, the glory leaves because of their sin and so forth. But my point is, here is Israel. They are encamped all around the presence of God. God's presence, God's glory dwells there. He's very physically close to them, yet spiritually, where is that nation? Okay? Do you really want to have your prayer life function the way their prayer life functioned, when what God through the Apostle Paul is telling you is that right now, God dwells where? He dwells in you. You are the temple of God. I am the temple of God. Any believer is the temple of God in this dispensation. And when we say things like, you know, God is not primarily concerned with your physical situation and your physical circumstances. He's more concerned with things like the state and the capacity of your inner man. People get freaked out and they say, well, you're, you're, just, you're just limiting God. You're doing this and you're doing that. You're taking away all this stuff from me. And what I'm saying to you and what I'm suggesting is I would far rather have God dwelling in me 
and have the, my prayer life function on the basis of that and building spiritual capacities into my inner man than having God be very close to me but spiritually far away. You understand what I'm saying? That this is better than that. It is. The problem is there's so much tradition and so much bad thinking and teaching and people don't understand what God has done for them as a member of the body of Christ. And if they would, it would change everything. Hopefully. Does that make sense? God is far more interested in you and I developing the spiritual capacities in our inner man and the doctrinal understandings that would allow us to properly respond to our outward circumstances than He is in manipulating the circumstances. That doesn't mean God doesn't care about you. In fact, I would say you have a, you have a closer relationship with God on that basis than Israel ever did in time past. Because you are in union, you are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are in Him and He is in you. And that has to mean something when it comes to prayer. Is that? So, I believe that we can learn much about how we should pray as members of the body of Christ by studying and following the example of Paul. By taking these prayers, you know, look, if you don't like the, what I titled some of these, fine. But study them. Look at them. Consider, what is Paul praying on behalf of the saints? What does this look like? How could this inform my own prayer life as a member of the body of Christ? Okay? So I commend that to you. Hopefully you'll, you'll consider that. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your word and for these saints that have gathered here and for the weekend that we've had together so far. We pray as we take a break and go take a nap or whatever it is that we're going to do, that these things wouldn't just be left in here when we walk out of the building, but they'd be taken with us in our, in our inner man, and that we would think on them and ruminate on them and wrestle around with them in our thoughts, and seek to understand how prayer does function for us as members, and learn from Paul's example. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right. Well, we are going to take a break for a while this afternoon. Um, so I do want to point out a few things. We are going to have at six thirty a concert and an ice cream fellowship following the concert. That will be here at six thirty. Okay. Tomorrow morning we will be in this room at nine o'clock, and Charlie will be bringing the study. Um, the goal of Pauline prayer, the fortification of your heart and mind, at 9 a.m. And then as part of our normal Sunday morning service, Brother Tom Roche is going to conclude things by bringing a study on full of care about prayer, relax, you can't mess this up. So we've got two studies left. We've got music. We've got refreshments. We've got fellowship later on this evening. Please, if you can, come back and be a part of that as well. All right. Appreciate all your attention. You guys have been a great attentive audience, and we will uh, hopefully see you later, or if not tomorrow. So we're dismissed. <laughs>